like your bow tie, Miss Lowe. You look good. You ready? Happy Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and friends of Baylor. Well, it had to happen. You know, I, I have a little bit of moderate hearing loss, so I got hearing aids. And so a lot of people ask me, can you now hear all the bad things that people are saying about you? Turns out I can now hear all the bad things, things I'm saying about other people. It's weird, I whisper to myself all the time. I, mean, I wonder if other people have been hearing that. I guess not. <laughs> For the first time, I'm like, I mutter a lot. Anyway, so my sister wanted to know about this avian flu thing. It's making the New York Times headlines and all. So it's true. Uh, you know, it's always something. We get over one pandemic, we got to worry about something else. So this is called a highly pathogenic avian influenza, HPAI, but it's actually, you know, the... Uh, H5N1 that's been around for a while that infects birds. The, uh, but on, what happened was in March, uh, a baby goat was detected with having H5N1. Uh, and since then, it, it's been concerned that it might spread. And then all of a sudden, there is some, uh, some illness in dairy cattle. And so since January and this February, there's been a, a sort of an outbreak in dairy cattle in Texas, Kansas, and New Mexico. And they have confirmed that it is actually the H5N1, a particular clade of that virus, um, a variety of that virus that's found in wild uh, birds and it's been detected in cattle. And so 10% of the cattle have, are found to be infected in those herds. And usually it's an elder cattle. I don't know if there's an elder cattle, an older cattle. What do you call them? I got an elder cattle farm. <laughs> anyway, so... Not to worry, uh, you know, they, the milk isn't being harvested from them, and even if it is, it's pasteurized, so it's not any problem for uh, people. Now, trying to figure out how is this happening, uh, officials have found uh, dead birds on those particularly infected uh, farms and have tested the birds that have actually they have H5N1. When they look at the virus that's in the wild, in birds and in cattle or even the baby goat, there's no genetic difference, so it's not mutated in any particular way, but that's always the concern. So there's no current risk for people. I mean, I like that. There's no current risk, but that doesn't mean, you know, things can't change. And the big concern, of course, is that, you know, if you go back to the 1918 avian flu pandemic, uh, the flu pandemic, it was an avian flu uh, species. So that's why everyone's all concerned. Uh, so, of course, as I say, there's been no, tra there's no, concern for transmission, on April 1st, Texas reported the first case uh, in Texas of a person being infected with H5N1, and this was directly the result of a person taking care of infected cattle. They had a little uh, conjunctivitis, and they tested them, and it turned out it was also uh, H5N1. Uh, this is the second human case. Uh, the first case happened in 20, uh, 2022, uh, which was a poultry worker in Colorado. So it does you know, get into people, but it, it has to be a direct contact. It, it, there's no evidence yet that it's been mutated in a way that it can go transmission from people to people. Now, if you just wonder about uh, what, it, what bird flu is, it's, a, it's an avian influenza. It's an influenza A. Remember, we talked about the two varieties, influenza A and influenza B. This year, mostly it's been influenza A, but not of this particular strain, the H5N1. This one affects uh, aquatic birds, birds of prey, and water and um, other waterfowl. It's most, you know, things like uh, birds that you find in your backyard, you don't have to worry about. Those, those don't carry it. It's not that they couldn't, but they don't. Uh, and it, there have been, over the last couple of years, fairly large outbreaks in poultry flocks in particular. And so far, 26 countries have reported 48 different mammalian species that can be infected as well. But if you go back to early 2022, uh, and I've talked about this uh, earlier last year, there were 9,000 wild birds infected and 82 million commercial poultry uh, flocks were infected. So it's a big hit to the poultry industry. Uh, this is the first time we've really seen it in dairy cattle. So that's the big news that you're hearing all the time. <laughs> so let's get back to the viruses that infect us. Uh, this is an interesting uh, comparison of COVID, flu, and RSV. It's like, which one is the, sends more people to the hospital? Well, it turns out in the red, you can see COVID sends more people to the hospital. That's because it's more pathogenic than flu, although flu is pretty bad. And if you look at what virus is around the most right now, flu is around the most. And in nationally, uh, the good news is that um, 
if you look at either hospital admissions in the blue or emergency room visits in the uh, orange, they're all coming down. And the, the predominant uh, species remains G J JN1, although JN1.13, that in pink, has been growing. The good news for Houston uh, is that we're continually, continuing to see a decline in the amount of virus. Uh, last, uh, on March 4th, it was 138%. Uh, this last uh, sampling was at 114% of the value in July of 2020. So we're getting down to as low levels as we've seen in a long time. And then the data from the Texas Epidemic uh, Public Health Institute, or TEFI, shows that all, it's what's great about them is they can look at all the pathogenic viruses and they're all sort of coming down. So one uh, quick little uh, piece of information on immunocompromised uh, uh, patients. There was a report out of the CDC that showed vaccination, of course, is very effective, particularly in that group, reduces hospitalization uh, by 38% within two months of vaccination and by 34% within uh, six months of vaccination. So a vaccine, very effective in immunocompromised patients, and yet only 18% of eligible people are vaccinated. So again, this is my lack of understanding of human nature. We have an effective vaccine, very effective, it keeps people out of the hospital, and yet only 18% of eligible people take it. Now, two weeks ago, we talked about all sort of the bad things of the virus, the things... I'd say the things we made mistakes in, we could have learned from the pandemic, but I think the best thing that came out of the pandemic is our traveler genomic surveillance program that came out of the CDC, basically looking at nasal swabs and wastewater. So the, the I, I don't totally understand why the CDC is doing it the way they do it, but the, it, it is sort of working for them. What they do is... People who come off of international flights have the op opportunity to do a short questionnaire and get a nasal swab. Now, if I'm traveling and come to the United States, the last thing I'm thinking about is, let me answer a survey and get a nasal swab. But apparently they've had 300,000 people from over 135 countries agree to do it. And what they do is then they, do, they look at the virus, they do RT-PCR uh, and do a genetic analysis. And so it actually was very effective at picking up that Omicron BA 2.86, which became JN1 uh, uh, here very, you know, very early. So I give, I mean, I give them credit. This is what the kiosk looks like. I haven't seen one of these. I think it must be when you get off the plane and go to the, you know, before customs. But the, it says, you know, you can come here. And again, if it were me, I'd walk by this thing as fast as I could. So, but instead, what I would be doing is just looking at wastewater and airplanes, and they are doing that. These are the eight international airports that are participating in the testing. Uh, you can see eight of them, including Chicago and Miami now, do nasal testing. Uh, there's this thing called a triturator that brings in all the wastewater from many airplanes and dumps it into it, excluding the local folks, uh, and then they can do an analysis. And then there are three sites that are just, I guess only two sites are actually doing just airplane uh, analysis from aircraft. So that uh, looks like um, New York and Dulles. The rest of them are like triturators being in Boston and San Francisco and the rest are nasal swabs. But I, I don't know. I, I don't really understand why they just don't sample airplanes. That, 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 that's a, a, a group, that's a, a, a group uh, that you can, you know, a number that you can see. You can test, and if there's some, if it was really positive, you could find the people. Anyway, I don't understand why they do it this way. I don't know if you've ever seen the the uh, show on TV, the, the worst jobs in America. Collecting wastewater from an airplane is right up there, but that's a that's an example of a guy <laughs> collecting wastewater from an airplane, so you can sample it. Uh, and and it, what's remarkable is, or I guess not surprising, considering the prevalence of virus around. About 25% of the pooled samples have been positive. And you can see in this kind of analysis, you can see the waves. This orange here was EG5, and then you can see when BA 2.86 was detected here in purple, and you can even see the newer versions right now, JN1, or actually, I'm sorry, JN1 is in purple, and BA 2.86 is in the pink. So it's very effective at doing it, and I think this will be <clears throat> one of the long-lasting uh, benefits of, of actually having the pandemic. I just wanted to mention one pathogenic paper which was kind of interesting. It turns out that the receptor 
that uh, is easy for the virus to get in. The ACE2 receptor is present in the, in the upper airways, and in an early stage, it seems like you just get sniffles, uh, but you get a much more in inflammatory response when you go in through cells that don't have the ACE2 receptor, and you can see that in pulmonary disease. So this is a nice uh, paper in Nature Cell Biology showing a potential reason why uh, there's a difference in uh, the inflammatory response based on you know, the, how the virus gets in. So I want to end today with a bunch of shout-outs. First of all, Dr. Ken Lau, our, our terrific uh, robotic heart surgeon, has done an amazing job. He's done over 600 cases, leading, uh, I mean, it's just amazing how many he's done. He does a great job. Uh, one of the greatest uh, surgeons in the U.S. for robotic surgery for the heart. Also, I want to congratulate the DeBakey VA Epilepsy Center that received national accreditation ratings. Uh, Michael DeBakey VA Center recently became the first VA in the nation to become accredited as a level four epilepsy center by the National Association of Epilepsy, Ep epilepsy Centers. So this is really, you know, the highest level of ep uh, epilepsy center you can be. Uh, and it's run by Pichaya Mandava, director of the Houston VA Neurology Program, and Dr. Zulfi Hanif, director of the VA's Epilepsy Center, epilepsy center of Excellence. And of course, it's the end of Ramadan. Next week will uh, mark the end of the holy month of Ramadan. And with the celebration of um, Aid al-Fitr. I hope everyone's observing Ramadan and gets to enjoy this uh, celebration of the feast. And one more thing uh, next week, of course, is the eclipse. <laughs> we talked about wearing the right glasses to make sure you, you don't have uh, retinal uh, problems. And of course, Lily has her. So be sure to be careful if you're watching the eclipse. And I hope you have a wonderful weekend and I can't wait to see you 